<laughs> right, hi everyone. I hope you can all um, see us okay. Um, my name is Mary Knight, and I'm uh, hosting uh, tonight's SICOM talk. Um, hopefully, we won't have any hitches. Obviously, Gabrielle and uh, Harmon have set up a high bar, and ho hopefully, it will go uh, smoothly. Um, so it's my really great pleasure to be introducing Joe Widdicombe as our speaker this evening. Um, Joe's one of the real champions of native bees um, in the UK. Uh, Joe originally actually um, completed a BSc in environmental science at Plymouth, which is where I work, and um, which is where uh, John Ellis and, and Vic Boswell, who you might have heard talking earlier in the sessions, uh, earlier in the um, season, um, both work, all work. Um, but more importantly, Joe's been uh, beekeeping for, I think, at least 40 years, possibly a bit, a bit more. So he's got an extraordinary wealth of experience. Um, and for about the last 10 to 15 of those years, he's been farming bees. And he now has, I think it looks after around 150 hives um, on the Rim Peninsula, which is just over the water from Plymouth on the far southeastern side of Carmel in the UK. Um, Joe's been really instrumental in promoting and rearing native bees. Um, he's worked as a bee inspector, um, but also been really highly influential kind of nationally in the in native bee um, world. For example, launching the National Bee Improvement Programme through uh, BIBM. So Joe, um, many thanks for um, speaking to us tonight and I'll, I'll leave it to you now to, to, to start your talk. Okay, thank you, Mary. Uh, that's great. Um, welcome to everyone who's joined us. And I will try to speak clearly and not too fast because I, I haven't got the clearest voice, but hopefully you can hear me all right. And I don't know what was advertised, but this is what I'll be speaking on roughly. Uh, sustainable Bee Improvement and the National Bee Improvement Programme that we've set up in Britain and Ireland. Um, so... This is what I hope to cover. What is sustainable bee improvement? Conserving Apis mellifera mellifera. Focus on local bee populations, a system that works. The National Bee Improvement Programme and putting NAPBIP into practice, putting it into practice. Okay. So, Mary's given a good introduction, but I will just uh, show you a few Photos. Uh, I don't know how to do a pointer there. Oh, that's, oh, yeah. If you can see my cursor, I don't know. This is where I live, down here, right in the corner of Cornwall, um, which is there we are. Um, that's the Rain Peninsula there. That area sticks out with a bit of sea around it. And it looks like this. This is Millbrook, the village I live. That's looking towards Plymouth, and this is Rame Head, the southernmost point. So it's quite a nice area. Anyway, um, I think in beekeeping we should be thinking about where we'd like to be in 10 or 20 years, or even 150 years, because that's really when things started changing, I think. 150 years ago, um, certainly in Britain, we started importing bees. Bit, bit more than that, actually. Um, we, we did modern beekeeping, um, removable frame hive and so on, it started about then. So a lot of us feel we've got into a bit of a state with, the, with our honeybees in a way, because we mixed up all the subspecies, made it very difficult to select and improve bees. Um, if we carry on in the same way, we won't be in any better position. No matter how long we go on, it will be the same. Poor quality local bee populations. Poor quality in that they, they're a bit random, they're genetically very mixed. The temper is very variable and so on. And we're always looking, because of that, we're always looking elsewhere for better stock. And that's a process that's been going on for as long as I can remember. Um, so the question is, can we develop a more sustainable system that gives us a hardy bee in tune with its environment 
one that can keep evolving to cope with changing conditions. I think that's what we're aiming for, really. Um, if we could achieve that, we'd be well away. Uh, can we find a way forward that suits most beekeepers and that can maintain or improve the quality of our bees in, in a sustainable way? Certainly that's what I've been interested in more or less since I started beekeeping. Um, when I started, uh, Brother Adam at Buckfast Abbey was a big thing with his Buckfast bees. And that's me listening to every word he says at uh, his, his matey apiary up on Dartmoor, which is a moorland area near here. Um, and I, I, when I started, I pretty quickly realised, well, the two things I wanted to know is, as most of us do, where can we get good bees? And because Brother Adam would tell you, the best thing you can do is buy a Buckfast Queen and rear offspring from that, and then you'll have good bees. But he did recognise that the quality would deteriorate over time as the bees cross with every other bee going. And the next question is, how do I maintain that quality? How do we keep good quality going? And his answer was, because I've more or less asked him that, um, buy another Buckfast Queen, buy a Buckfast Queen, rear daughter Queens, and then buy another Buckfast Queen when quality starts going down. And it's not only Brother Adam that says that, that's a ver more or less the conventional view of beekeeping. That if you want good bees, you've got to buy them off a bee breeder, bring them in, you can keep it going for a while, but things will deteriorate and you've got to keep buying a new stock. So I wasn't very happy with that, I must say. I didn't think that was a very good way of carrying on. And I, I was quite keen to see, improve the stock I'd already got over the generations. There are problems with that approach that I think we can call the conventional approach because that's more or less what most beef, not all beef farmers, most beef farmers want, they subscribe to. <clears throat> Bringing in good queens, what are the disadvantages? Well, it's been highlighted in this country. We've had tremendous amount of imports of queens in this country. And most people are aware that there is a risk involved, a biosecurity risk. We might bring in further pests and diseases or, or variants of the ones we've got already. So that's quite a serious issue. There's no selection of queens for their performance in local conditions. Okay, these queens might do well where they came from, but we don't know if they'll be any good in the conditions we've got. There's no development of local population, local adaptation in the bee population. So our bees can never really adapt to local conditions because we're always bringing in new genes into the area. There's no regard to mixing of subspecies. One person will go for one type, one will go for another. One will go for a hybrid bee like a Buckfast and we're mixing them all up, making our local populations even worse really, as far as consistency is concerned. Local populations become very difficult to select and improve as a result. And this is the big issue, people think, impossible, we can't do anything with these bees. We're gonna to have to buy in more stock to, to deal with it, get a good bee. So it's a vicious, vicious circle of import followed over time by a declining quality. And I think a lot of people recognize that. <clears throat> Brother Adam recognized it. He didn't think it was a bad thing, but he recognized that you'd have to keep buying his bees. And this is what's happening. These are the original subspecies in Europe. And we've been bringing in, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see my cursor, I'm hoping you can. Um, bringing in the Carnica, bringing in Italian, bringing in Buckfast, which are a mixture from Denmark, it's quite popular. Various other things from the Mediterranean particularly, and various other places in the world. So we're carrying on mixing everything up. And this was a graph someone came up with a few years ago. Um, they did some DNA sampling of the random samples of bees in Britain. 
and they compiled all the results and they thought the average population of Britain was like this. What surprised us actually was that <clears throat> they were, they reckon 45% of our, of the genes in this country were of our original native species or subspecies and the rest were a mixture of various other ones. So how do we achieve a system of sustainable bee improvement? Well, what is it for a start? Um, <clears throat> and I think we can define sustainable bee improvement as a system that can maintain or improve quality <clears throat> indefinitely. So it can carry on either maintaining a good quality or improving when necessary. It's not a system where stock has to be repeatedly brought in in order to deal with deteriorating quality. So bee improvement is about maintaining the qualities that the bee needs for survival, and achieving and maintaining the qualities that we want as beekeepers to see in our bees, because we don't necessarily want the same as what nature selects for. Nature just selects for survival, basically, which is incredibly important. We would, would be nowhere without it, but we, we as beekeepers also want other qualities like possibly good, we might not agree on what the qualities we want, but we might want good temper, we might want high productivity, we might want low swarming or healthy bees or a combination of those. And <clears throat> so the way to achieve that is to refine our local populations through a process of natural and artificial selection. Um, so Bibber have been preaching this for quite a long time and other bee groups around Europe think the same way. But getting that message across to more than a few is another story. So I can hardly see that because something's come down. But anyway, conserving Apis mellifera mellifera. That's what Sikkim is quite interested in. So why could serve Apis mellifera mellifera? Well, subspecies of honeybees are very important genetic resources, and that's a good enough reason in itself. We need to preserve genetic diversity. Um, that subspecies is probably the best suited for survival in our conditions. It tends to dominate if we give it a chance by not repeatedly bringing in other subspecies. They tend to be the best survivors which is a good basis, I think, for bee improvement. Um, bee improvement's much easier to achieve within a sun, single subspecies. Um, many bee breeders say the same thing, and many stick to one subspecies. Brother of them was different in that he liked to cross subspecies to produce a hybrid, and he got the benefits of hybrid vigor then. Unfortunately, with the bee's mating system, uh, it's not like other farm livestock where we can control the matings once those hybrids are released into the wild or into the environment. They just randomly cross with each other and we end up with a bit, a bit of a random hybridization. <clears throat> so how do we conserve Apis mellifera? I think there's two models. Um, one of them is to find a genetically pure population propagate it and distribute it, which has been very popular. It was popular with Bibber for a while. Uh, another one is to refine our local mixed populations through selection and improvement and see if we can get back to a purer state over time. So this is the first model. You find your increasing from a small population, you find your pure stocks of AMM, it may be a limited gene pool because there may not be many of them. <clears throat> That's the disadvantage. Finding pure stock can be difficult. Uh, Biber ran a thing called Project Discovery quite a few years ago now, looking, searching the British Isles for pure stocks, which they intended to breed up on a big scale and distribute to those who wanted them. Only those 
with pure stock can participate, access to pure stock can participate in this model. If you haven't got pure stock, you can't take part. <clears throat> can we maintain pure stock without introgression? Certainly in most of, for most of us, it's very, very difficult because we've got so many mixed bees around us. Are we trying to put the clocks back to something we had in perhaps the 1850s? Um, and it, is it possible and is it good? Conservation or improvement, you know, which are we trying to achieve? They both have their value. I'm not going to answer that question because I don't know the answer. Um, this is the model two, where we take what we've got, the bees around us, we've all got bees around us, so we've all got a starting point, <clears throat> and refining our local bee populations. All beekeepers can participate, so everybody around here, for example, or wherever you live, can participate because there's bees around you, and those bees can be included in the scheme. The system preserves the best locally adapted stock, various ecotypes that may, may have their value. Imports have a negative impact, so, and less compatible, so participants have the incentive not to use imported bees. That's the first thing you do is stop using imported bees. You just use what is surviving around you. Refinement of stock over time. And that's what we're trying to achieve. And we, the bee population can keep evolving to be the best for the local conditions. The question is, can 100% purity be achieved? I'm throwing the questions out, but I'm not intending to answer them. But there's something to think about. And does 100% purity really matter? They're questions we have to think about. Right, move on. Uh, so to go into this model two a bit more, we start by refraining or stopping from using imports. And that's the big uh, issue around in Britain. That was a big issue because we were importing more and more bees each year, mainly from Europe, of different subspecies. So if we can find a way of stopping that, it would help us to select and improve what we've got. And then the next stage is to accept the benefits of natural selection. So in your local population, anything that isn't coping with the local conditions will die out. And you're left with bees that survive and thrive in the local area. So it's a very good basis for your selection improvement program. From there, you can then, with it based on natural selection, you can then select for the qualities that you want to see or we want to see. So most people like beekeeping with nice bees. So we want good temper. Um, a lot of us want productivity. We want them to produce a lot of honey and so on. You can choose what qualities you want to see in your bees and select for those. <clears throat> we can use the input of bee breeders, but they, they need to be compatible with our local bees. No good bringing in another type of bee. The aim is to maintain a genetically diverse population, which is where everyone agrees is really important, but one which breeds true. And that's the, the crux of the matter. The situation we find ourselves in is that bees are so mixed up, it's hard to get them through. You might find a colony that does really well. So you breed rear and queens from that colony, and then they're perhaps nothing like the parent colony or nowhere near as good. And we're all different types amongst that sort. The so breeding true means that the offspring resembles the parents. The focus is on refining and improving our local populations based on what does best in local conditions. Bee breeders do have a role. They can help reinforce what we're trying to do locally by refining and improving the local population. So for example, we might start with a local population of bees, our background population, which is whatever we find, different areas are gonna have different bees in them, 
depending on what imports they've been subjected to over the years, what has survived in those particular conditions. If we stop all imports, and that's the place to start, that doesn't add anything. Exotic imports don't add to, the, to our quality. <clears throat> they just continue to mix things up. So, right. And then don't add anything X, just take what nature gives us. So natural selection will play its part in molding the local population. This can, gets completely blown away if we keep bringing in new bees, so we don't. We stop doing that and we just start working with nature. Nature will mold the population to the bees most suited to our conditions for survival, that is. We want a bit more than survival as beekeepers. We want some other qualities. So we don't just rely on natural selection. We also want the input of the beekeeper, artificial selection, choosing for the qualities that we want to see. So we, we work a system of natural and artificial selection to get a decent bee. And bee, bee breeders can contribute as long as they're working along the same lines as us which is pretty crucial. It's no good bee breeder coming up with some sort of bee that bears no relation to what we've got in the area because that just makes this random hybridization again. We're back to square one. So how do we refine our local bee population in practice? Well, we assess our colonies, they look at the colony, we stop importing, we start looking at what we've got in the area, we assess them. We select the best for breeding breeder queens. We rear offspring from those breeder queens. <clears throat> How do we get good mating of queens? Because that's the big key to the whole situation. We have to remember that any queens we rear from these breeder queens are going to produce good drones from unfertilized eggs. So that is the key to the situation. So the more queens we can rear, from our breeder queen, whatever they mate with, and they're going to mate with all sorts to start with, because that's what your area is going to be like. But they're still putting out with good drones because we've chosen the best queens in the area, so they, the drones should be pretty good. And gradually, you can build up a system where you're producing good drones to mate with queens from your breeder queens. Obviously, you choose new breeder queens each year. You don't just run a tiny little gene pool that's going to get inbred. You try and vary as much as you can. Select an area that you can dominate with your drones. Small-scale beekeepers find it difficult, but the way to get around that is to work together. They can all work together and pool their resources to make an impact. Dominating an area, I can't read it because there's things in the way, but dominating an area, um, I think it's something like to make a breeding zone. Aim to dominate an area with good drones. You do that by rearing from your breeder queens. The area could be chosen for topography, areas of water, low population. And there, are, there may be mechanisms that favor nat the native bee. In Britain, we think there is, or some, a lot of us do. I don't think it's been scientifically proven yet, so a lot of people don't like to accept this. But um, I think there is a mechanism which tends to favour the, the native bee uh, mating with native drone, native drone and queens mating. Um, it's possibly to do with temperature. They may mate in cooler conditions than imported stock. Uh, some people say they often use this apiary vicinity mating rather than forming drone congregation areas in fine weather. Um, don't know and don't want to get into that right now, but there are possibilities. <clears throat> this is where I live in South East Cornwall, the Rain Peninsula. And you can see I've got sea around me pretty much which helps. It's not great for forage because half the forage area is sea. So the bees don't produce masses of honey, generally, 
but um, it's great for bee breeding because you are, can limit the amount of drones coming in from other people's bees. So I've got several apiaries here of about 12 stocks each. And, um, to, and the, there's amateur beekeepers in this area as well. Most of them have only got two or three stocks perhaps. And most of them are into using the same type of beer as me, which helps. Um, this is about this, this graph, that's five miles or what, eight kilometers. So you can see the sort of zone we're thinking, speaking of. Um, up here, there's a different type of bee. There's one person with a few different type of bee down here. So we are, we are at risk and it's ne never gonna be perfect. This is one of my apiaries. Um, I usually overwinter them with, there's 10 here, but we, I usually overwinter them with 12 stocks in on a site. <clears throat> and then I come along in the spring. This is, I'm just trying to illustrate how we put it into practice really. Um, <clears throat> come along in the spring and look at the colonies, go through them. I've already got my records from last year and how they performed, what the tempo was like and so on. But I can do a final check and see what survived out of the 12. If they haven't survived, fine, they're out of the picture anyway. Um, I'll go through, and I, look, I look at the bees. Are they a nice, I, I select for the native strain of bee. So I like them to look like a native bee. I mean, we had to talk about that from Dora from Portugal. She said you, that wasn't reliable, but I'll try and show why I think it does help in a minute. And so I go through, I want to see them looking native, consistent quality, consistent appearance in the hive. I want to see them really well behaved. I want to see the queen laying well and nice brood pattern and so on. I want to see them healthy. Anything that doesn't fit the bill, fit those criteria will be moved out of the area, out of the breeding zone. So it doesn't take any part in the breeding. In other words, any drones it rears won't be affecting, won't be mating with my new queens. So, uh, to on the, this thing about appearance, uh, I know Dora has proved that it's not very reliable. Um, I know it, it has been used before. Um, I read this in Eva Crane in her book. And it was used in the 60s in Egypt when they tried to set up a breeding program using the Karnica bee to replace the local bee, the Lamarchii. And they, the bee, two types of bee look quite different and they use that as a marker. So different body colorations, they illustrated to them when the crosses weren't good. In other words, if they weren't within the strain, they could tell straight away and they could weed out those colonies. And so they just could use the ones that were of the strain that they wanted. And I think it's a useful technique, which we, we, we do that in Cornwall. Because it's quick and easy, you can do, we, when I started, I did a bit of morphometry. There's always a lot of debate as to how, how accurate that is. More recently, we've got DNA analysis, which is interesting as well. Uh, it's not cheap, it's not quick. <clears throat> we don't often get results in time to be useful for us. Um, so I like my bees to look like this consistently through the colony in the breeding area. Outside the breeding area, they're not. I haven't got them to this consistency, but inside the breeding area, I like them to look like this. Um, and I basically they've got a dark abdomen They've got um, yellowy brown hair around the thorax and, and they've got a definite distinct appearance. And this is you, the queen, they don't always come out dark. Sometimes they're a bit stripy, dark stripy. They vary a bit, but I really judged the colonies on a consistent appearance within the colony. If I find there's quite a few orange banded ones, I take that to mean that the queen has actually mated with at least one or more, say, buckfast drones, which are the most common variety around here, if apart from native bee. 
So that's probably what's happened. So then I, I know that new say that new queen might be. The reason I come along in the spring is because those any new queens that I've had, they've had time. All the progeny will be their own. So if there's a lot of orange banded ones, I think oh the mating wasn't too good with that queen, and I'll take them out of the area, and uh, that takes them out of the breeding situation. Uh, and it doesn't, and it helps my other apiaries out of the area because she will be producing good drones because she came from a good breeder queen. And this is what the workers look like. They're pretty consistently dark and there's no orange bands there. So I'm happy that she's mated within the strain. <clears throat> and we've had some good DNA results and we've had not, some not so good. And this is using our system of judging them on their appearance. I mean, these three results here were all came out really, we were really pleased with those. They don't all come out like that. Quite often they come back as, I think it depends which lab you send it to, to some extent. I think techniques vary a bit, um, but the scientists tell me I'm wrong, if they want. We sent seven, seven samples off on that occasion and five came back as 90 to 100 percent pure or probability of pure, I should probably say. And two came back 50 to 75 percent probability. So that, I found that quite encouraging that our techniques were roughly on the right track. Um, now to talk about the National Bee Improvement Programme. Well, I, I said at the beginning we were in a I think a lot of countries are, but I know Britain, I know the bees in Britain and Ireland most, most well. Ireland, we know, is pretty good, actually. Uh, but if we talk about Britain, we've got a tremendous mixture of bees here. And we've, we had a tremendous problem with people, more and more people bringing in bees from Europe and mixing them up even more. So what happened was, well, how this programme came about, or well, the idea for the National Bee Improvement Programme, DEFRA, which is our Ministry uh, for Environment, Food and Rural, rural what is it, something, um, <clears throat> they were, they're responsible for our beekeeping and our bee population. So they were concerned about the high levels of imports from a biosecurity point of view, because they were worried about we might bring in other pests and diseases which are gonna knock our bees for six, like Varroa did when it came in in 1992. And they held a series of meetings and didn't reach any sensible conclusions and then fizzled out. I was on the committee for this, these meetings and I reached a different conclusion and I saw the opportunity and I saw the way to reduce imports is to provide an alternative system. <clears throat> And that alternative system, and also that alternative system needs to improve the quality of our bees in a sustainable way. And that was how BIBA came about developing the National Bee Improvement Programme, which is only in its infancy, but it's a system that we hope will gain support and become a, a way of life for beekeepers in this country in time. The programme aims to get the support of as many beekeepers and beekeeping organisations as possible in Britain and Ireland. I've already alluded to the fact that Ireland is in a much better position generally than Britain. But BIBA traditionally has covered Britain and Ireland. Ireland and Scotland have since set up their own native bee groups. So perhaps BIBA isn't so influential in those areas, although we have got members in both areas anyway. Participants agree to aim not to use imports. That's, a, that's really the only qualifying thing you need to take part, that you don't use imports or, or offspring of recent import. That's a starting point, because if you keep bringing in new stock, it's a non-starter, you're gonna get nowhere through natural and artificial selection. So this is how we start. Everyone can download their record cards, they, we've agreed that people can adjust these cards to suit their own needs. <clears throat> they can put on what qualities they want. This is basically the version I use, and you might not be able to see it clearly, but um, I'll tell you what's on it. Right? Every time I inspect the bees, I fill in a, a row along here. 
So one of the columns for me is native appearance, because I'm quite keen to keep some consistency within the stock. That's the main reason for me selecting native bees. Well, I think they tend to be dominant, given a chance, and they it gives me a chance of getting consistency into my breeding program. So that's why I like to go for those. We haven't specified that they must do that. The people, participants must do that. But we have specified that they must not use, you know, if possible, they must try not to use imported or offspring of recently imported. So we feel the tendency of stock will be to, revert, naturally it will revert to the native subspecies because that tends to dominate given a chance. Uh, this column is for temperament. So if they're, everything's marked out of five, one to five on a one to five scale. <clears throat> so if they're really lovely to handle, I'd give them five. And that's what I'm looking for for my breeder. Anything I want to breed from, I usually try to find a five. Uh, swarming propensity. I don't like it to swarm in their first full season, if possible. Uh, brood and health pattern, honey yield, and so on. Um, I try to keep the qualities we set for to a minimum, because the less things you set for, the easier it is to make progress. And you can always refine it later on if you get to a good standard. So selection of our breeder queens, that, those record cards help us select our breeder queens. We soon can see which ones are really nice to work with, which ones are laying really well, lovely brood pattern, uh, good health, good temper, and all those qualities that we want. So we can very quickly pick out the, the ones that are worth breeding from. As I mentioned, this is a kind of summary really. As I mentioned, the key to the system are the daughters of the breeder queen. So the more queens we can rear, the more, offspring we're going to have that produces good breeder queens and you know because I'm going through those aprils and everything is of consistent fairly consistent quality I know that all those bees that I've left in the breeding area are going to produce fairly good drones so it's going to improve over time the system so the water queens will produce good drones regardless of what the drones are mated with select a breeding area I've already talked about that concentrate good, good colonies in this area and you'll get many good drones. I do not actually um, do anything about encouraging them to produce drones. I, I assume that all those colonies in the breeding area are good and I let them produce as many or as few drones as they like. I move undesirable colonies out of the breeding area. And they have their other uses. I mean, if they're a queen I reared last season, they're from a good breeder queen, they'll be putting out good drones into the areas they're in. And that stock is always useful for making up nukes. I'm always looking for bees to make up nukes, make up new colonies, or for honey production, which we also need. So what does the National Bee Improvement Programme offer? It's a system based on the bees, that is the genes that, all, that we already have in our area. So it's based on everyone in that position, they can use the bees based in their area. Bringing in incompatible genes adds nothing to the system and merely restarts the selection process. You know, bees left alone will develop the ones that survive they have developed this local adaptation. The ones that do well in our area are the ones that thrive. They're the ones that produce most offspring. So <clears throat> it's a self-selection process. That's why we don't keep bringing new stock in. Program is based on selecting the bees that do well in our conditions. Natural selection gets rid of unsuitable genes. Artificial selection by the beekeeper produces the qualities that we want. It's a good system. It, I think it works. We're encouraging beekeepers to refrain from using imported bees, assess colonies in their area, identify suitable ones for breeding from, get the breeders to produce breeder queens, the daughters of the breeder queens to produce good drones, and just keep repeating. And it gets, 
easier and better each year. When you start off, you've got lots of bees that are pretty poor quality and not resembling anything you'd really want. But over time, you get more and more bees resembling what you would like in your bees. So it, it gets easier gradually and you've got a bit more choice and a bit more selection and you can refine it a bit more. As far as AMM is concerned, um, in the National Bee Improvement Program, I said we haven't specified you've got to aim for this. But we think the conditions we've set up will favour that. And we, we do encourage people. We, we don't say you've got to do this, but we encourage people or we explain why it's to the benefit to select that subspecies. And I, I, as I said, I think it's to the benefit because it makes them more consistent. They do tend to dominate. So you can maintain your strain is easy, easier. And that's basically it. And I said I'd speak for about three quarters an hour, so that's about right. So th thank you for listening. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Okay, thank you. Okay, not like that. Great, thanks, Joe. Thanks so much for a really informative and insightful talk. Um, and I'm sure there are going to be a, a lot of questions coming through. How I just wanted to know how. Um, how long has the National Bee Improvement Programme been in place for? And could you, do you have any kind of feel for how good an uptake that's had in the, across the UK? It's quite interesting because um, we've only started in 2021 publicising it. Um, <clears throat> we've two ways you can kind of tune into it. And one is through joining BIBA, which is our native bee organisation. The membership of that over the last few years has been rising and it was traditionally about 300 members and it's now a thousand plus so that's a good a positive sign and the other way you can and you that's you join maybe you pay an uh, annual fee and so on but the other way you could join the national bee improvement program is just to register your interest and you do that for free and beekeepers have been doing that as well so we think there's um there's been a bit of overlap between the two groups, actually, so it's been a bit confusing. But we think that's getting on for about a thousand as well. So there has been interest. We've also tried to get the beekeeping organisations around Britain and Ireland uh, to adopt the programme. They've been very slow in coming forward and they've all got their prejudices. Uh, a lot of people um don't like Biba for one reason historically for one reason or another i think in the early days Biba perhaps <clears throat> put people backs up for various reasons it's a different organization it's the same aims as it's always had but perhaps we're going about things slightly differently right. we're getting a lot more support than we ever had in the past even so we're disappointed that no organization has joined us yet but we're confident it's only a matter of time because more and more beekeepers are expressing sympathy with our ideas and the BBKA which is the biggest beekeeping organization in England voted by a huge margin at their annual meeting to um, in favor of banning imports of bees which is quite radical I mean even Biber doesn't call Biber doesn't approve of imports but we don't call for a ban because we prefer to go about it by providing an alternative. Um, so BBK, uh, in a way, is more radical than us in that respect. But we're, so we think their members feel quite strongly along the same lines as us. So I, it really must be a matter of time before they join our scheme. Yeah, no, that's that, that's oh, yeah, I'll just say encouraging, really. Um, because yeah, it does seem like imports is one of the, the, the big things that really people need to either be persuaded or yeah. that there needs to be some actual policy in place to be. Perhaps to I should say that, of course, one of the biggest imports of bees is the Bee Farmers Association. And let although they and a proposition was put at their annual general meeting to ban imports, but that failed to get a majority. But it did get about a third support, which we thought was quite encouraging. Um, it's not such a big thing to be coming from a third to becoming a majority. 
and more and more people are aware of this issue with imports, the biosecurity problem, and as far as Bibber is concerned, just um, it does. We think it spoils any hope of the improvement. Yeah. And please do for those those listening, please please do post your questions in the in the chat, um, and we'll uh, go through questions um, as they as they come up. What <clears> what do you think? I mean, I, I I thought you kind of captured in a nutshell the conservation versus um, imp conservation or improvement. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to press that. You said already that. You yeah, it's a good it's a really interesting topic that yeah should stimulate debate because. It, um, I think, um, understandably, scientists are always looking for the pure strain of AMM mm. and wanting to conserve it for good reasons. Yeah. Um, practically, how do we do it? You know, uh, we know we can do it on an island, for example, or yeah. in Columbus Bay, but on, on the mainland, it's more difficult. Yeah. Um, and I don't think probably anyone has cracked it in Britain, really. Well, perhaps they have actually in some areas. I know some people have got pretty good. Yeah. But I think that introgression is always going to happen. Yes. Um, and we've got to try and work our bee population away from it. Yes. And I think that's the, that's the principle behind the National Bee Improvement Program, mm -hmm. is that we, we're starting from a really awful base, if you like, a real mixed base. Yeah. Some people think it's good because genetic diversity is a good thing, but I mean, I think uh, the, the Colos report pointed out that there's genetic diversity and genetic diversity. And if you bring in a load of genes that aren't suited to your area, what gain is that? Yes. And they yes. use the phrase maladapted genes. Yeah. So that's quite interesting itself. Yes. So I try to explain to people that you can have genetic diversity within a subspecies, otherwise how would the subspecies have survived all these years? Yes. They're very genetic, they're diverse in themselves. Yes. And so um, a lot of people don't grasp that. So we've got a, a couple of questions. So um, Jonathan Ellis asks, could you tell us more about your use of natural selection? For example, how much do you recommend intervening over winter, adding food in the June gap, if you have one, and do you treat for parasites and so on? Yeah, re really good question, John. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> where shall I start? Well, it's become really popular amongst beekeepers now these days to um, feed their bees the whole of the winter, put candy on top. Uh, it's a you know solid, semi-solid food, and they can nibble away if they get short. When I started beekeeping, nobody did that, really. I mean, it's very, very rare. You fed your bees in the autumn and then let them get on with it. Uh, because now we've got much more imported strains, which quite a lot of them just breed all winter long. Um, so they get through a tremendous amount of stores, so they need feeding. Um, I'm still a bit old fashioned. I don't feed my bees at all in winter. That um, I let them, I feed them in the autumn if they need it. Uh, the mature colonies don't generally need very much. They've usually got enough stored because they, they bring in a lot in the autumn. And, but I rear lots of your, your new colonies and they do need build, building up. So I'd have to feed them quite a lot in the autumn. Um, but in the winter, then I don't intervene at all. Um, in the spring, I will probably, yeah, I will intervene. I do intervene mostly. I look, um, with feeding if they get starving, like we had a terrible spring last year, mm, yeah, and definitely. some colonies needed yeah. to, to survive. But I do know beekeepers who don't intervene like that. They prefer just to be pretty hardy on the on the bees and thinking they get a better bee in the end of it. Um, with Varroa is another interesting issue because the standard in Britain is that you treat the bees promptly and regularly. Uh, and I experimented a bit with, I know more and more beekeepers have been ignoring that for, uh, uh, ignoring that treatment and getting away with it. <clears throat> we don't know how it's affecting the performance of the bees. It may be taking a bit of a toll, but they're managing to keep going year on year without any treatments at all. And you hear of that more and more now, which is quite interesting because we have had Varroa in this country for 30 years. So bees have 
built up a bit of a tolerance and I've started experimenting myself. I first year I took two column, two apiaries out of treatment. One survived really well, one apiary. Um, one apiary didn't survive so well, but I also had another apiary near the, that had been treated that didn't survive so well. I had two apiaries that didn't, so oh, it's a bit confusing. Really, I wasn't convinced that Varel was taking it whole. So we've taken a lot more out of treatment this year. We've taken a bit of a gamble. In the past, I have done it many, a long time, quite a while ago, and I did get very heavy losses. But I am in favour of working, definitely going towards that system now. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks. So Adrian asks, hi, Joel, thanks for this interesting talk. A few questions. First, what is your stance on treatment-free beekeeping? So I think you've just... I've more have said, but I think it's... I mean, I would probably be hammered by certain beekeepers who think you must do it by the book, but I'm quite sim very sympathetic towards it and moving that way myself. Okay. And secondly, last autumn, autumn, there was quite a buzz about population of local AMM on the Blenheim estate in Oxfordshire. What's your take on this story? Yeah, again, um, very interesting. Um, so do you want to just, um, there might be people obviously who are not aware of that story perhaps. Yeah, sorry, so. yeah. yeah for those who aren't from England, um, a recent story cropped up. There's an, a big estate in Oxfordshire and somebody has been monitoring the colonies in, living wild in the woods there and they have found an incredible number of colonies in living in hollow trees and so on. And they've, they've been monitoring them accurately. I felt I heard a talk by him and it was good. Um, and he's claimed that they're <coughs> native or near native subspecies. Uh, this has been really taken badly on some of the online forums. They're all making a mockery of it and saying it's impossible, blah, blah, blah. Uh. But he's, I've been up, I, I know that area well because my father lives just a few miles from there. I go up there quite regularly and I'm always looking at the bees foraging in his garden and I've seen what must be descended from imported bees, very orange things. And I've seen also seen bees that look very native in type. And I, I've seen the slides from the man who's been monitoring these corners and there's, they're very native in appearance too. And it's logical that bees that survive by themselves, I've already said that they, they've got a better survival rate than the imported bees. So it's hardly surprising to me um, that they will resemble, resemble native bees. The DNA analysis, I, had, uh, I think he hasn't released that yet, but who knows? I think it were, they're bound to come out fairly native, I would have thought. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so Vanessa asks, good evening, Joe. Um, your presentation is very interesting for our work in France. So FEDCAN, the Federation of the AMM Conservation Associations. Thanks a lot for explaining so precisely the process of, natural, of um, the National Bee Improvements uh, Programme. Um, I'm waiting for your answer to Jonathan's question. But I have full interest in your answer. And my question is about how it's possible to coordinate the bee breeders in order to have a stock of local bees for backyard beekeepers. And I think that's a really important question, isn't it? It's, it's, um, Sorry, can you say it again? Uh, so it's about how, how do you coordinate and make sure that um, um, the bee breeders have enough stock of local bees um, to be able to um, um, give, give queens, for example, or, or to, yeah. to backyard beekeepers? Because I think that's a, a critical question so that people yeah. won't be looking for imports. It's a really difficult um, set up for most people to uh, sort of really get their heads around how we do the implement this bee improvement program. It's a bit easier for me because I live on a peninsula and I've got a lot of bees. Um, anybody who wants to buy bees around here, they know about what we do around here and that most, any new beekeeper, they tend to buy bees off me, which helps. And I give them a discount because I'm, I only want, I want to encourage them rather than them buy off the internet and bring in some strange subspecies that yeah. is native to here. So you've got to help people. 
Um, if you're a small scale beekeeper, it's difficult. You've got to get the cooperation of other small scale beekeepers and pool your resources and try and work together and try and saturate an area. And it's not easy, but that is not to say you should give up. You've got to keep trying and getting, you know, if you can find a beekeeper with a few more colonies who's sympathetic and you can all work together, you can identify an area. It might not be in your, where your home apiary is, for example, but it might be able to identify an area that you could feasibly between you saturate and you know you've got to use the local topography the local bodies of water and air, various things that might help if you're in a mountainous area it's easier but yeah. <clears throat> that's not typical of England or large parts of Europe yeah. um, so it's, it's no I don't pretend it's easy but I do pretend it's possible <laughs> I don't I don't mean pretend but it is possible and I that was the whole aim of my project was to show that beekeepers can make a difference. We don't have to just rely on bee breeders and then go to them all the time for, for our bees, which is what the story was when I started beekeeping and as a, has remained. We can, beekeepers can make a difference, but they, they will have to pool their resources somehow. Okay. Um... So the next question is from Patrick Malloy. Um, on the basis that bees in the wild produce 10 to 20% dro drones, do you not think that we should encourage our best colonies to produce, say, a full frame of dro drones to flood the locality as much as possible to improve local breeding? Yeah, well, a lot of people do do this. Uh, I've never found it very satisfactory. Um, you put a frame in, sometimes, it's laid out fully with drones. And then you've got to get a really good system going of rotating. And, and I, I prefer, personally, I'm in a semi-fortunate position in that I, I do have control of the majority of colonies in this area. Mm -hmm. And I do know that the ones I'd leave in this area are good, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm happy to let them rear what they like. But there are there is definitely a case for getting certain colonies to breed more drones, especially when you're starting off and you really haven't got an area very uh, secure with your drones. So there's definitely a case for making, giving yourself more chance of getting a good mating. Yeah, okay. Um, I think that's the end of our uh, questions um, for now, unless anybody else, has anyone else has got some urgent last questions, please put them in the, in the chat now. Um, Oh, hang on, I've got one more. That's something came in. Vance is replying, thank you for your answer to my question. I agree that beekeepers, beekeepers help people networking. How do you estimate the needed time to let local bees dominate in an area protected from imports if the system is well in place? Um, well, natural selection kicks off straight away. So in one winter, you're going to lose some colonies you know, um, every year it goes by, it's going to get better. <clears throat> when I started, um, I did start selecting bees. And then I don't like to put a time scale on it really because it just depends how intensively you, you're able to do it. I mean, when I started in the 90s, and I only had about 20 colonies, and most of them were not native bees, but there were one or two that resembled a native bee, uh, you know, and I and I'd looked around and, you know, you pick up a swarm here and a swarm there. And someone said that wild colonies in an early or ones that live in trees are nearly always uh, resembling the native bee. And I think there is some truth in that. There are the ones that survive in the wild. And so there will be native bees around you. Um, I, I, you can't really put figures on it, but it's a case of just trying to do a bit better each year. That's when we, we actually set up an improvement program with a group of bee, beekeepers in this area originally, or in Liscard area, which is mm. not far from here. And we did it by, I gave talks for various times. And then a few beekeepers came to me and expressed an interest in what I was doing. And those ones we just worked with. And some people weren't interested in it, remotely interested in what we were doing. They preferred to buy a buckfast queen. But the ones that express interest, they're the ones you work with. And um, that's how you go. And you, 
when we formed this group, we've had to just try and make a bit of progress each year. As long as we were going in the right direction, we felt we were progressing. And sometimes you get setbacks and you get disappointments, but you keep going and eventually things will pick up, especially as more and more beekeepers latch onto this system. And I think they will in time, quite honestly. So you just gotta try and get something going. Yeah. And, uh, and that's it. You, you raised actually, you talked there about, um, and we talked a minute ago actually about, you know, wilder feral bees. What's, what's your impression Joe, of how, you know, is there a substantial population, do you think, of um, wild feral or, fe well, or feral, yeah. feral bees still in the UK? Mm -hmm. There must be more than we think. I mean, I couldn't believe how many uh, the man from Blenheim Palace found in those woods. And he's logged them all. He's not just making it up. He showed film and everything. He's been tree climbing so he can get up into the treetops and see that they live quite high up usually. Right. I only know of um, a couple around here, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> there's one in a chimney pot and there's one in a tree. And it contradicts everything the man from Blenheim said because they're really low down. In oh, okay. foot off the off the ground and they are black bees but yeah. they may have come from one of my colonies but they're certainly yeah. living and, and thriving in a in a tree yeah I'm sure there are more around here and the other people i've had communication with people someone in another area and he was a bit like this man in blenheim he's been locating wild stocks and he's found quite a few in his area so oh, okay. okay there was some research done and uh it wasn't very encouraging in that they were f genetically, they found that they were mostly resembled the uh, colonies in their area. So they may not have been very long lived. Well, right. I think anything yeah. long lived, you'll probably find resembles the native bee. That's my theory. Right. Yeah. And I yeah, think there are a lot more around than we think. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and Grace, obviously, in Ireland is doing a lot of work. That's on, right. On yeah. That. And they survive without treatment. Right. Yeah. Obviously, anything yeah. else. Anyway. Yeah length of time yeah yeah it's, it seems like it would be definitely worth a kind of a push to try to get a bit more information on that really yeah, yeah. great um let me just check i think oh something's just coming so, yeah john john asks has the beekeeper in blenheim checked the feral colonies for varroa do you know i'm not sure uh yeah. it's very difficult <clears throat> because um, he hasn't got very good access to these colonies. He, cl he yeah. does tree climbing, rope climbing, you know, it's highly skilled. And mm -hmm. he gets, but he puts cameras into the trees and gets good mm -hmm. films of them. I don't think he's seen many varroa on the bees or anything. Mm -hmm. He seems to be under the impression that the, they've got low varroa accounts. That was, what, I think, what he said. Um, but to do a scientific analysis would be quite tricky, I think. Just many. because of the access problems. Yeah. 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 Living really, uh, yes. living quite high up in oak trees mainly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think uh, we don't have any more questions. So I'd just like to thank you again, Joe, for a, a really great talk. And as I said, I think you kind of uh, crystallised some of the real key issues that we're trying to trying to deal with, I think, in the in the UK. And it's really good news, I think, the National Bee Improvement Programme, and I really hope that it, like you say, I think um, there does seem to be a, a, a tide shifting, I think, yeah. in terms of public opinion on these kinds of things and amongst beekeepers. So fingers crossed we can get, you know, at least people appreciating that importing bees is not the, not the way yeah, forward. Yeah. Right. Yeah. OK. okay. Well, thank so you. thank you very much. And, and thanks to everyone else for, um, yeah. for their time, for attending. And I think um, I think as far as I'm aware, Gabriel is uh, Gabriel or Harmon will be back next next week to host okay. for the talk next week. So so we'll see you all then. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.